Yeah. So could you just tell us a little bit about how that came about, why you okay. did that? Um, yeah, I had uh, learned about victims' assistance and Patricia Smallwood, and I went to one of her meetings, and I had approached her with this getting an unsolved program started for Indiana to profile unsolved murders and crimes, and so I had said, well, we need, uh, our big problem is funding for the program. So what we need is fundraising to raise the money, and she had sent me to Terry Doran. She said that he could help me with the fundraising and having benefits to help raise the money for it. Now, why did you initially want to even get an Unsolved Mysteries program started? Because my sister Darla had written America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries, and they both said that they had far too many cases already, that they couldn't handle the cases that were coming in. And I just felt that maybe if Indiana had its own program, then some of these cases could be solved locally. Now, did you, you had a, a case personally happen to you? Yes, uh, my sister Pam was murdered in uh, 1995. She was taken three blocks from her home. And we have no suspects, we have no clues, no vehicle, no witnesses, nothing to go on. And there are also four other women missing. Two bodies have been found and two haven't. And it's the, the last one occurred uh, around December of 1996. In the same area? So yes, you're within a 10 mile radius, they've all occurred. And one woman wasn't from the area. She had driven from Terre Haute down to Lampton to her brother's grave. And she was in the graveyard when they took her from the graveyard. And my sister's case, hers was the only body that was taken out of state. They took hers over across the line into Illinois. Now, do you think that a show like this is going to have what kind of impact? Well, as in my sister's case, a lot it's a camping area. It's Green Sullivan State Forest, and people from all over. As a child, I lived down there, and I know from the people that I had met then that people come from all over the area, Ohio, Illinois, and northern Indiana, Kentucky, to go camping there. And it's possible someone from one of these other areas may have seen her or one of these other women in a vehicle. But unless they know that they've seen a crime, they're not even aware that they've seen something. And with, with coverage on the TV regularly and, and widespread across Indiana, maybe some of these people might realize, hey, I saw that girl. And that's what we're hoping. Now, how much of a response did you get from authorities in that area? Did you think it was good enough? <laughs> well, as, as most families feel, we don't feel like the police are cooperating with us. They, they, they keep evidence away from us, which on one hand we understand that um, because if the killer comes forward, there should be just some information that only the killer would know. On the other hand, we feel um, that if we had some evidence, we might be able to figure out who did it by our association with the person because usually they say it's a family member or someone that you know that has committed this crime. And if you knew some evidence, you might be able to connect it to that person yourself, you know, from personal knowledge. And um, of course then you have so many police associations working together, like in our case we had the Illinois police, they had to have the cooperation of the Linton police and because her body was transported over state lines, they also had the cooperation, they had to cooperate with the FBI, and then you had the, the state detectives involved. And if all these organizations don't work together, then you, you've got a block right there just in the system, let alone outside of it. And the question is, how well do they work together? You know, how well do they share evidence with each other? Um, we had heard just in mention the uh, Illinois police were not happy with the Linton police because they felt that the Linton police did not cooperate with them when they had found my sister's body. So you have to wonder, is the problem in the system? You know, or is it in the people? Now today, are you finding a lot of people with similar stories along those lines? Yeah, um, a lot of these people, the majority of people here have known the killer or the suspect uh, in the cases, and a lot of them are family members or someone close to the family. 
And there, the biggest thing is lack of evidence. That's the only thing standing in between a conviction and not convicting, is lack of evidence. And this show somehow will bring that out, hopefully bring people forward with... Hopefully this, this program will bring witnesses forward, like I said, that aren't aware that they have seen something and maybe trigger something in their minds or in their conscience. Now, the group discussion, what kind of okay. issues did came up and what kind of things did you talk about? Um, well, we've discussed how we felt that our cases were handled and we've discussed the fact that many of us do know the suspects and uh, how we feel that things could have been done differently. Um, and the, the, just the pain that, that is caused overall in the families. Uh, um, and the hard part is not knowing, but then there's always the question in our back of our minds, how much do we really want to know? Now, as far as uh, the families you've been talking to so far, uh, do they find it painful to talk about these things that have happened, or is this sort of a part of the, the process of helping them get through it, get over it? You know, I don't think you really get over it. I think you learn to live with it, and you learn to go on because you have to, because your life doesn't go on hold. But there's always that part of you that will always be stuck in that time period when your loved one died. You know, there's a part of you that will never move from that until you have some type of closure. Um, and then for some of us, even closure isn't going to make a difference. Would, how would you describe the atmosphere today? Is it hopeful that things are going to be good, or is it more catharsis like we alluded to? Well, I think it's catharsis in some ways uh, for many of us, although some of us that have cases that are two years old or older, we have spoken often about it. And um, as in my case, I, I quit being sad and I got angry. I, and I decided to do something with that emotion rather than just sit around and be angry. I decided to put it to work for me. Um, I think the biggest thing is we all need closure. Is this something you see yourself continuing once you find personal closure? Yeah, yeah. This is something that I, that I actually will hope that uh, will be picked up if, if I don't carry it on, which I won't back out until I do have someone to carry it on. I will stay with it and until somebody who's better able to fund it, better able to, to produce it, than I am comes along. If they come along and want to do it, I will gladly hand it over to them. But I will stay with it and I will always supervise it to make sure that it's being done to, to the victim's interest and not to the criminal's interest. How many families do you expect to uh, talk to today? Well, I'm hoping 21 families at least throughout the day. Um, it will be staggered in and out, and I've actually had one more family come up here that I hadn't met yet today, and they heard about it and they came up, and so I got information from them, and they will now be trying to group in the fight. And we have people from all over. I have a, a picture of a gentleman from Anderson, Indiana with me, and we have people from Geneva here, uh, New Haven, Columbia City, a villa. I think that's all the families that have, that have come today. Now, what percentage of those, or how many, are unsolved cases? All of them. All, all the people that will be here today are all unsolved cases. And that's just, according to you, just a fraction, really, of right. this is Northeast Indiana. Right, that's just the few people so far that have become aware of the program. Since it's a new program, you know, it's taking a little while for word to get out. But eventually, I'm hoping more families will join in the fight. And the more we have fighting for this, I think the better off we will be. Now, do you anticipate this being an Indiana project or staying in East Indiana? Uh, Indiana, all over. All over. And also, um, there are some families that I want, you know, even if they're 
loved one was murdered in another state, but they're here from Indiana, those families also will be included. It, it doesn't matter necessarily where the murder occurred, but the, I, it's the families of Indiana. Now, how will people see the, uh, the finished program? Where will it air? Um, we haven't given the, the film to anybody yet. We're waiting to get it edited and put together into a package. And when we have a package to offer, then we're going to offer it to the local TV stations and hope that someone will pick it up and air it. Now, is this something you expect to do weekly, monthly, yearly? Well, I would like to see a weekly program done actually as far as the, the TV program to profile and solve murders. Um, right now our biggest problem is funding for the reenactments and everything, uh, but we're hoping uh, that soon we'll raise enough money to be able to do that, at least fund one program. That's cool. Uh, actually, could you state your name for the camera? My name is Stephanie Boger. And how do I spell, actually, both versions, both the first and last name, you never know. S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-B-O-G-E-R. That's B as in boy. Okay. That'll do it. All right. We're rolling. Oh, we're rolling? Uh-huh. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about why you got this started? I mean, you're a nonprofit agency, correct? Uh-huh. And someone came to you, why were you interested? Well, the, <clears throat> I make documentary films, and the first one I made about 10 years ago is called The Shadow of the Dream, which I did with WPTA here in Fort Wayne Channel 21, and it was about a terrible murder of four young men, and the mother was shot in the head. They were all lined up, shot in the head with shotguns by four other young men. It was a random killing that did it just for the thrill of it. And, uh, that was my first documentary, and the Shadow of the Dream, the title, means, uh, you know, the American dream of equality and justice and all this violence and the indifference to victims and the shadow and the dream. And so when Stephanie uh, got involved because of her sister's murder, she contacted Pat Smallwood at Victims Assistance, and Pat had worked with me on the Shadow of the Dream, so she recommended oh, me. So that specifically is how I got involved with Stephanie. As far as this program today, uh, I have for a long time done social issue uh, public forums, a show called Theater for Ideas, which I used to do quite regularly, now I do sporadically. But this is certainly in that theme of, of uh, people coming together to discuss social issues. and. Since I've been running the loft for about a year, I have tried to turn the loft into an open space for expression, artistic, community, social issues. Uh, we have done a lot of kind of punk rock shows, and I'm worried maybe people think that's all we do, but we have done, for example, in this same vein last November, we did a tribute to Justin Blessing, who was a young artist who suffered from schizophrenia and was killed by a hit and run driver. We did a day in my life with Scan, which was uh, uh, documenting abused teenagers' lives. And so today falls clearly within that vein of what I'm trying to do at the loft. And specifically today, you know, I think it's a very powerful experience for people who have this terrible bond of having lost a loved one to violence come together and know they're not alone, to share ideas, to see so much they have in common uh, as far as the way the police investigate, the media reports it, the laws that, that choke them really from catching the killers. And in all cases, all these people, the crime is unsolved, so it's a double tragedy. I mean, it's bad enough to lose the loved one, but of course there's no closure when nobody is captured. And so that's what we've been doing this morning, is finding this common ground, this, this sense of I'm not alone, and then later we're going to do individual interviews. But it's a very powerful experience, and I, I think the essence of what's good about America is, is represented in people like Stephanie, who without any funding, without any, any permission from so-called authorities, 
just goes out and sees a need out of raw passion and a sense for justice and makes things happen. That's really the only way things do happen. I, I have been myself lately the victim of a stalker, I've been getting death threats, and I know the system does not respond to, to uh, victims for whatever reason. I mean, and I mean, and as many of these people have said, it's not that specific people in the system aren't caring or wouldn't like to help, but they'll say there's nothing I can do. And that today, besides the finding the common ground, is to see can we affect some changes? Can we actually in some way from what we do today a, maybe catch a killer, maybe just one out of here or something, and B, you know, maybe make just one change in one law, who knows, but that's the way things get done, I mean, one person starts it and then there's a, a, a gathering of, of strength, and that's what we have here today, and I think what people are doing is turning their grief into strength, you know, it's this feeling of helplessness that is the worst feeling in the world, I think, that breeds all the depression and futility that so many of us feel, and that, that we can't do anything. And if nothing else, I feel today has really made a giant stride toward breaking that kind of, there's nothing I can do, because I think these people are really uh, finding strength in each other's stories. And, and it's very touching you know, to see people find that kind of strength. I mean, the first thing I said to everybody was thank you for being brave enough to come here today. And if there's anything you're not comfortable saying, don't, don't say it. Or maybe as the day goes on and you get more comfortable with me and others around you, you will say it. But only, only when you're comfortable. It's just too sensitive of stories to uh, just say, okay, what, what, what happened? So we're kind of gradually getting into their stories. We started with group discussion. Now, would today be the first phase of production then? Today's the first phase, yeah. We'll do these interviews today, then I'll see what needs to be done next. I, I doubt if we would need more victim stories, but I might go do some location, like go to some of the houses they're talking about, or at least find pictures from the newspaper. Now, a lot of them, of course, have pictures of their loved ones. They have newspaper accounts, which will be very, very helpful. What do you, where do you see this going in the future? Well, Stephanie would like this to lead to, I'm sure she said this, to a state TV show in the uh, tradition of America's Most Wanted, only it be Indiana's Most Wanted. And so that would be good, obviously. And the documentary, wherever we can, wherever we can get it shown. But I would also like this to lead to more uh, regular meetings like this at the law, either with these same people, the same subject, or even different subjects, but uh, of the law being a place where people really feel comfortable to to speak with one another. You talked about this being a place for social expression, and, and you want to keep these this kind of um, group discussion going. Why do you care? I mean, why is it important to you? Well, I've just I have I guess what you call an artistic sensibility of, of being having had some personal tragedy myself and being sensitive to others. I think that's what makes an artist. It's also what makes you crazy because. You know, most Americans, frankly, try to block that out. We're a very materialistic society. I mean, buy things, buying things as a substitute for feelings, I think. Now, I mean, that's an overgeneralization, but just as an overgeneralization, I think that's what our culture values. And I think that an artist's job is to try to, to break through that wall, break through that denial, break through that indifference, and the truth, so without sounding too pompous, I mean, it's just, I'm almost what you'd say obsessed with it. It's just so much a, a regular part of me. Of uh, And I just get so 
mad at injustice. And, and, and uh, of course, murder is itself terrible injustice. And then it's compounded by the system, by the media reports, and so forth. But yeah, I think that's what drives me. I mean, I, I just I can't stand working nine to five jobs. And I, I mean, really, we're all volunteer at the loft. I mean, I, I, except for special projects, we get a grant or something. I really don't even get paid. But uh, and, and as I said, I'm really proud of today. The loft has a lot of things, and like the punk rock shows, they're an expression for kids, and it gives them a place to go. I, Myself personally wouldn't come to them if I wasn't running the law. Let's put it that way. But I would come to this. So I think that's what drives me. I think that's cool. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, sure. I used to be able to see that about my For coverage, you can count on. You're watching News Channel 15 Nightcast, where the news starts now. A violent crime against a helpless victim is our top story tonight. This 86-year-old Avila woman was found suffocated, and her home had been ransacked. I can't imagine anybody who would, 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 could even think of doing something of this nature now. Good evening, I'm Lee Kelso. And I'm Karen Hensel. A senseless crime. That's what relatives are calling the overnight killing of 86-year-old Julia Garti. News Channel 15's Drake Hill Burns covered the story for us today. She's back from talking with the family earlier tonight. And Lee and Karen, family members are calling this a senseless crime. They're calling it senseless because, number one, they say she had nothing of value to steal. And number two, they say she was so fragile, so helpless, she couldn't fight back even if she wanted to. Family members say intruders broke into 86-year-old Julia Lee Gardy's home, used her pillow to suffocate her to death in her bed, and ransacked her home. Gardy's family says she was in no condition to resist her attackers because she weighed less than 100 pounds, had pneumonia, and walked with a cane. All they would have had to do is just shut the door. She wouldn't have and held, put anything in front of us. She wouldn't have been able to open it. She was that fragile. Gardy was a widow who lived here by herself off County Road 125 South in a villa. Her family, who often checked on her, lives nearby. You're looking at a picture of just some of them. Family that includes six children and 28 grandchildren. Some were at the house after the killing, comforting each other and remembering. Kind and loving. Uh, things I remember about her is she had a knack for remembering all the kids and grandkids and great-grandkids birthdays and special events. She was the greatest person on earth, except the Lord, and I can't figure out why anybody would have ever done what they've done to her. Family members say they believe three, there were rather two or three intruders because the house was ransacked so badly, they say one person could not have done it alone. And the family tells me that the intruders did steal something, but they wouldn't tell me what because they don't want to hurt the investigation. Okay, thanks, Drake Hill. If you have any information at all that can help the investigation or help police find these criminals, please call the Noble County Sheriff's Department tonight. Police stop it. Okay, thanks, Drake Hill. If you have any information at all that can help the investigation or help police find these criminals, please call the Noble County Sheriff's Department tonight. Police stop in Auburn
brand fact. Uh, I can't imagine anybody who would that could even think of doing something of this nature now. Good evening, I'm Lee Kelso. And I'm Karen Hensel. A senseless crime. That's what relatives are calling the overnight killing of 86-year-old Julia Garcia. Channel 15's Greg Gilbert covered the story for us today. She's back from talking with the family earlier tonight. Adorable. It's good. 
to do that and before they could allow her to they uh, put a paper uh, requesting that I'm ready to come from. that's when my biological mother died. she took the witness and after six years right, okay they started kindergarten and the company got you yeah Girl. and then I was back and then, uh I reached the age of six I was for, um, left for like a year to that time was back and so that's why she so you were like with her till what like, the sixth grade about? Yeah, back and forth. So. Back and back and forth. Right. When you went back to town, then did you not come back to Miss Virginia's or? Uh, while I was living with her, no, I didn't come over here. Um, 
when I when I lived with her, I went by her rules and right. stayed there at her house. But when I got old enough to make choices of my own, yeah, I would come over here after school and stuff like that. So when I had my first child, as, as soon as I came from the hospital, I came over here with my daughter. Uh, so that Virginia could see her. And I, I'll never forget, she said, oh, it's, she's a little you all over again. Cause she, my name is Sheila and she would always call me Sheila for some reason, she pronounced my, my name in that way. And that was fine, but she's very dear to me and I love her a lot. So she was your mom during right. the most critical right. growing right. time exactly. from kindergarten to the sixth grade. Exactly. That's, exactly. That's why she means so much to me. That's why I'm in here gathering her gowns to take uh, home. So I'll have something to show my children. How many children do you have? Now? I have seven. I have five sons and two daughters my and gosh. a husband. Yeah, I am married. And you've probably told all of them about Miss Virginia. Yes, sure. I have. Yeah. yeah. So she's like grandma or like exactly. grandma to so yes. children. And you yes. live in Ohio now? Yes, I live in Toledo. Did, and Miss Virginia just, so, so she never really was able to legally adopt you. You were right. pretty much just out of the goodness of her heart. But, right. Okay. I mean, obviously you were adopted, but I mean, yeah. the papers. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Uh -huh, a, you're welcome. She's a beautiful woman, one of a kind. Yes. That's for sure. That's for sure. Oh, oh, right. Right. Yeah, try it. Let me see what it looks like. Yeah. And uh, she was only 14. And the uh, one day we one day we had, uh, came back from doing some work, and the uh, welfare department had taken. All three of the kids away without any notice, and uh, we uh, worked, they worked out finally worked out arrangement where they could come back, and uh, uh, we uh, helped those kids in a lot of different ways. And they would stay over here quite yeah. quite often. They'd yeah. Come over like after school and right. stay until there was somebody home that could officially be uh, in charge. And uh, she was she was uh, 14 years old then. She was the oldest of three. And now she's. Uh, regional system administrator for Sprint Midwest. Oh really? Yeah. Where did she live now? In Kansas, in uh, she's New Century, here? Kansas. You know, she didn't. She couldn't stay. Oh. Yeah. Oh, she can tell her story. Wow. Yeah. She came back. Yeah. Yeah. All the way from Kansas. That's incredible. Lord, I wish I had. I didn't know who she was, but. This was when you were living here? Yes. Yeah. You lived here two years? Yes. Yeah. And how old were you about? What? Uh, Approximately. About 33. Oh, you were you lived here as an adult? Then. About 80, yeah. 80, uh, 80, 81, 82. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, then I, uh, my uh, mother was dying of cancer, so I took care of her during her last year. So, remember Tara Williams? She was living next door here. Yeah. Ed's girl. Yeah. Joanne and Edwards. My sister. Yeah. She was a sister. Oh, I Yeah. Oh, the way. Yeah. Hold that up a second, please. Oh, you hold that up so I can get video that's too much. Let me stand. Thank you. Sorry to 
That's better, thank you. They don't drink, they just sell the stuff. Excellent. That's good. That you need it. It's all your hands. Because the house was a separate house next door. So they were taken care of because you and Miss Virginia and other people here were taken care of. There was always someone here. So and uh, I don't know if that's what convinced the uh, authorities to allow the children to come back. But, uh, they were allowed to come back. So that, those almost, you probably felt like they were taking them from here. In yeah. a sense, yeah. almost like an insult because they were taken care of. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was uh, an uncomfortable situation for the children to uh, be put in a position where they would have to go next door. But nevertheless, it was a, there was always someone here, and, and they were always welcome, and, and they were just like family. And you hadn't seen this lady probably until she left until today. Right. What a jade. <laughs> and she was here? Darn, I wish I had. Yes, yeah, so I wish she would have been able to uh, come to dinner with you. I just didn't think it was enough. I'm glad you told the story. That's amazing. Yeah. She's doing very well now. And their, their families spread all over the country. Uh, Edward is in uh, Dayton, and Julian's down in Kentucky, and she's out in Kansas. So. They're all doing fine, <laughs> despite the welfare department. <laughs> Thank you, Howard. It's quite a story. What, what brought you to Miss Virginia? I mean, were you uh, for those two years? Well, I, I was looking to uh, uh, serve in the community at, in the uh, same uh, way that uh, uh, St. Francis and others have served. And uh, I, uh, I think Daryl, uh, Daryl, I, I stopped at a, a uh, transitional living house down on Wayne Street uh, and talked with a fellow named Daryl. Well, I know somebody who's doing that, and uh, he uh, even brought me up here and introduced me to Virginia, and uh, we hit it off right away, and I, I moved in that week. No kidding. <laughs> so you really were doing it as part of your life mission, and, and actually were helping Miss Virginia. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine yeah. there's never a dull moment, was there? <laughs> no, no, it was a very, very hard work. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. Right here in this corner here. At the end of very long days, we often wouldn't eat until after midnight. Uh, and uh, we would always Eight. sit down and have a, a, a gathering where we'd share the day's work and, and uh, reflect on uh, what the needs are in, in, in different families and different people and, and plan out the next day. And it was a great time. Yeah, it was. How many people? Were you the only one living here, or were other people no, there living was, here? No, Paul, Paul Rezel moved in at the same time. As well, okay. It was uh, coincidental that we both arrived at the very same time, moved in the same, in the same, almost the same day. Or, yeah, he one said day apart. that, and he ended up being best man at your wedding, I understand. Yeah, we had... I, had lots of best people, lot best people. Oh, yeah. best people. It, it would happen right here uh, yeah. in Miss Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How appropriate. Yeah. We had it. Was, uh, I think somebody ran a uh, mower through the lawn the week before, so we had a, a place to everybody could comfortably walk. And, <laughs> and so. <laughs> it was a great a kid. My like kids from the neighborhood showed yeah. up, and uh, my uh, the wedding pictures. Uh, the, the main uh, background is some chicory growing next to the old house next door. <laughs> and so I've always had a close attachment to uh, to that plant. Uh, that's my wedding plant. That's your wedding plant. <laughs> uh, beautiful stories. And, and, so I've continued to uh, grow chicory in the city is uh, actually, that's when the city uh, condemned our yard for growing chicory. 
And uh, they came in, <laughs> came in one day with a, a crew one afternoon and just chopped down all the flowers and everything. No kidding. No kidding. And uh, how are you, you people who live here in Miss Virginia? They're such troublemakers. <laughs> Growing chicory in your backyard. I had no idea. <laughs> Whole different image. So, what did you do? Are you kidding? They came and chopped your whole backyard down. Everything, everything. They chopped the chicory. They chopped the flowers. They chopped everything down. And uh, uh, when I Ray called up uh, uh, Gary Baton at the uh, neighborhood code enforcement, he was apologetic and said, "Well, I tried to call them not to do it." And uh, it was too late. I'll be back in Yeah. Is it growing back? Why what happened? Yeah. It's growing back now. I, mean, I just do the same thing every year. It's, uh, these are plants that can withstand the, uh, the the tug and pull of a lot of children. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll pick one of those up. I'll get some more. Okay. I'll be back. I'll be back. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well. As I can understand, Miss Virginia helping other folks. She has been doing this for uh, ever since I was a son. You know, just to keep yeah. go by there and help people and you know, get them food, cookies, or whatever. You know, and I grew up with, you know, uh, thinking that hey, everything's going to be all right, you know. And then they came down, she got sick, and when I found out, she had died. You know, it's been many years since I was here. When was the last time you had been here prior to today? Uh, about. Last month. Well, last month. So last you'd year. seen her. Okay. We're talking about trying to Oh, yeah. But, you know, life goes on. Everybody. You know. That's where they come in. It's irreplaceable, though. They buy I mean, her, her work can go on, but I believe Miss Virginia may be your, one, of, one of the few humans who's irreplaceable. There will never be another one. So, there's nothing I can do but just say a prayer for her. Well, they got food. Can I get your name, please? <laughs> well, how about just your first name? Kurt. Kurt, okay. Thank you, Kurt. That's fine. You live here in Fort Wayne? Yeah. yeah. We call me kid. I'm not a kid, all right? Look what you did. Oh, God. But I think, oh, I think that... Uh, that somebody is just going to have to actually purposefully sit down and make a decision or a second decision. Yeah. Whoever's going to be on this board or whatever it is, May or you or well, not me. Well, I don't even know. No, I'm, just I'm saying. not even on that board. See, that's <laughs> Sue and I think the now that's the secretary to Founder O'Connor. What's her name? Oh, um. God. I know. Oh, that's like just two to go. Yeah. And Miss Virginia will tell each one of us what we're supposed to do. I don't know about Miss Virginia, but you know, I think the spirit will tell us. Yeah, Father O'Connor said that in the sermon. Did Yeah, he says Miss Virginia's place will never be taken; it'll always be hers. The position will always be Miss Virginia's. Nobody will be able to fill the place. I think that's the extemporaneous uh, obfuscation of the uh, of the original paraphrase. You know that uology had that woman to read. Uology. Whatever it was, E U O L O G Y. I, I couldn't tell you where it was the other night, and I read it, and I thought, well, that'd be nice to give. That was speech. nice, wasn't it? And here that woman gave that speech. You know, that was Sheila. Remember Sheila? That was a little no. Sheila. That, that no, it was an older lady, a black lady. I'm talking about Sheila. Not that lady was on the end of Wesley Key. You know, the young lady that got up there? Yeah, but this was an older lady that read the one I had fought to fight. Yeah. Oh, that. Okay, yeah. now I know what you're talking about. I can't even remember it, but um, when I was in the spirit, boy, that thing rattled off like a computer. And then I went to bed and forgot where it was. Hey, Terry. <laughs> let me, let me that catch you right now. Okay, you got me. Light on, this looks pretty good. And I heard you say that we can all continue Miss Virginia's work. It might be different.
for everybody, and it might not be the same as what she did. But. Sure. Well, I think, you know, I think that uh, that's kind of like the old same old story. You know, we we hear that, uh, you know, such and such a person. Oh, they're so they're you know they're so incredible. And yes, that's true. Miss Virginia was incredible. But um, as long as you don't start saying, I can never do what she does, you're, you're right on the money. And uh, to do what she does is what we're all asked to do, is what we're all called to do, and what we all should do. If we really respect what she did and admire what she did, then we should go and do the same thing. And I think um, it's kind of like, you know, like we break up the little pieces and we, we divide them up and spread them out, you know. And it's the same thing with Miss Virginia's house, okay. Like the pieces of bread at the uh, mass. The there you go. That, that's a good example, okay. sure. Yeah, or in the scripture when Jesus divided okay. up the bread and the fishes and stuff. So I think that uh, we all need to carry in, inside of us the example that she gave us and then go and do the same thing wherever we go. Um, Miss Virginia's house um, will continue. Uh, this particular address will continue, but I'm not really sure yet uh, how it will continue. Um, I don't think anybody's really talked about it very much, apparently. And um, I've been out of town, so I don't have a clue. But I think that uh, out of that meeting, whoever is going to meet and talk about the future of the house, there will be some interesting things said and decided. But even if it's not, and, if, and it won't be the same as Mr. Uh we're still required to go out and do likewise. You know? so, That's what Jesus said. You know, He said, go and do the same. That's what we're going to do. So her legacy hey, really is to continue her work in some Absolutely. shape or form. Sure, and, I, and she would probably even say it's not her legacy. It's the legacy of what we're, we're called to do by God. And so, I, I like the point because hey, she is so honest. daunting. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you think, I could never do what she did, so the tendency is to don't do anything. But we can exactly. Do but yeah. it's like the... Uh, <laughs> It's like that. Get back here. That's like the, uh, you know, the uh, the Zen Quan, you know, we're like, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Hmm. Well, you know, until you, like, at least try to figure out, you know, what that is, uh, you're not even going to, uh, you know, when something seems impossible or insoluble, maybe that's what I'm trying to say, uh, it may very well be impossible or insoluble, but just by the very act of taking a stab at it, uh, a lot of good things happen and come into, into exactly. existence. Yeah. Exactly. And if everybody's doing that, then the combined energy force is incredible. Right, exactly. Incredible. You know, how many times do you think that Missy has come by <laughs> and done a lot of hard work, or her mom, you know, May, and they've done all this hard work? Yep. Ten years. She about grew up here. There you go. And May's been working hard, hard, hard. And now, wherever, wherever you folks go, wherever you go, that's going to continue, you know, it's like it's growing. There's a, there's another good point because, and I admit I was guilty of this, you tend to think of Miss Virginia as a one-woman show, but I mean, it took a lot of people to make Miss Virginia, a lot of, and she would tell you that, I mean, she That's doesn't true. try to convey she's a one-person show, it's just an image you get, but like the young lady here, her mom, all the people here today were all people either all touched by Miss Virginia and many gave a lot back. I gotta tell you something. Miss Virginia started doing what she was doing just on her own. Uh, she was in various communities that were very, that later on became very important in, 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 in the area. Like for example, she when they started the the retarded children's school that later on became ARC, or when they did mm -hmm. the, uh, um, the part of the uh, the the racial justice group that used to go around and sit in on uh, uh, on you know, racially segregated uh, lunch counters, and they would go in, and, or theaters and stuff, when they did that kind of stuff. But but ultimately, even though she was in all these groups, and she was in the Matthew 25 group, she was in this group, she was in that mm -hmm. group, ultimately, she was she was a one-woman show. But then each of us are, ultimately, in our right. lives. Even though we're part of something else, we're all one-man or one-woman shows. And I think you should take her inspiration on that level. You say, well, this is what I can do with my own life. I could do something like that. I could share share things with people. I could be more open, you know, I could, uh, you know, maybe have a little less, you know, uh, uh, you know, go uh, second class instead of first class. Uh, uh, like she always quoted uh, St. Vincent to Paul, live simply so that others might simply live, right, exactly. And so I think, uh, 
every little piece of that that I have in me now, that I carry on like where I live in Colorado Springs, that's what she inspired me with and that's living on. It's yeah, going on. Miss Virginia is going on. It's, it's like, it whoa, hello, it's still well, going on. Yeah. Well, there's two things. I, mean, I said she's what she is and isn't a one woman show. I mean, the thing is, it takes a lot of people to make a Miss Virginia, but she also didn't sit around, which I admire about her so much, and say, well, I don't have any money, or I don't have a place, or I don't have this, and you know, if I had this, I'd do something good, but I don't, so I won't, and she just did it. And that's what all people that are really inspired, I think they just do it. I think so. So, all of us should look at that and say, I know it's daunting, you know, like you say, you know, it's like, you know, uh, intimidating to, to try to measure up to something like that. So don't try to measure up to something like that, but try to do something. Be yourself. Be yourself. Yeah. Be yourself automatically. And then try to do something a little bigger than yourself. Beautiful. Now, in closing, you have a unique perspective on Miss Virginia because you lived here for 10 years. About 10 years, roughly. Tell me a little bit about that, how that came to be, and what it meant to you. I, you know, okay. I guess there were like two or three different things that sort of uh, come together at the same point. Uh, one is her kind of iconic status for me when I first came here. She was like this living saint, you know, I was going to stay with and so forth. And so I'm going like, you know, uh, you know, it's like how do you how do you coexist with somebody who's like up there, you know? Yeah. So that had to break down. I had to realize that this is a, a normal human being. This is a person, you know. This is not some angelic being, you know. Sure, she's a, a little guardian angel or whatever, but she's not some kind of superpower able to, uh, you know, uh, do all these things because she had some kind of faraway look in her eye. She was, she was mugged. She was, uh, she was broken in on. She was, you know, knocked around. She got a lot of mistreatment, you know. She uh, then when they closed down the Holy Family Center where, where it started, she just she just, you know, went out on her own. She had a little bag, you know, her little bag and went off on her own. And um, I um, I think that um, that aspect of her humanity, breaking through this sort of pedestal that I was putting her on, that was a very important part of my uh, acceptance of her and understanding of her. Come on, Miss. That's okay. Yeah. Missy, Missy keeps it going here. She, see, you see how hard so, she's working? So she, secretly, she wants to be on tape. So she oh, that's okay. She, she should. You should get I her know. on. You should do her. She, she keeps hiding. Oh, Missy, you should. You can tell a lot. Yes, she, yes, she should. Yeah, I think she should. But anyway, uh, <laughs> um, so that was one of these things that met. Another thing was that Miss Virginia has a vision, you know, and it's not just a vision that's totally hers, it's a shared vision, this vision of doing something which puts you at risk. It was born of the philosophies of Dorothy Day and Catherine mm -hmm. Doherty. I remember her telling me sure. about that. So this, this is the second big thing, and that's something that, that lives on, you know, and, and, and preceded and lives, came before and goes after Miss Virginia. And so that's the second thing. It's something that's, okay, it's bigger than not only than me, it's bigger than Miss Virginia. <coughs> Bless you. The third thing, okay, the third thing is my own, this is, now this is just my own, you said my own perspective, so you're getting it now. My own thing is I got my own little hang-ups, my own little history, my own needs, why I'm here, what am I about, you know. That's all tied up in this too, you know, like why am I here, why am I doing this. Come on in, yo. Hey, how are you doing the, uh, uh, trace Trace? Trash sack? Trash sack. Oh. The big one, the big, the big one? Uh, am I standing in front of him? No! Oh. You find him? And I have my own, my own mission. Like, I'm, I'm being ministered to here. Uh, and the ministry that, that it says that I need to have something ministered to in me. I'm, I am some kind of broken aspect of myself. Mm -hmm. So my imperfections, my weird habits, my. Okay, don't don't you start. <laughs> don't you not to agree? No, it's true though. My own little oddities. You know, my need to be here is also met. It's met by being with her. It's met by being here. And it was, and it is. Thanks, sir. You know what? The Beautiful. Told Thank you. How you doing? Yeah, 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 yeah. No a little bit, a little bit. You're fine, you're looking at you. You're like a red. Hey, come up here, we'll have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, 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 he said,
Yeah. I'm asleep. So you must be 17 now, is that right? 16. 16. I'll be 17 for the show. Okay, and you've been working for Miss Virginia for seven years, about? Ten. ten? Almost ten. Almost ten years. What? What have you learned in those 10 years? How has it changed you? That we shouldn't judge a person by the color of their skin, but what's in their heart. Beautiful. Are you in school now? Yeah. Now, did you ever live here, or you just came to help? Pretty regularly, like daily? Yeah, or every day when I got out of school. No kidding. Up till the day she died, you were doing that? Yeah. What school do you go to? Northside. Do you know Mr. Flickinger there? Yeah, he's a good friend of mine. Yeah. Tell him, my name's Terry. Tell him I said hi, would you please? Take a lot of him. Uh, anything else you'd like to say? Your mom, is that your mom out there You're sitting on her lap? And she helps as well. So it's a real family kind of yep. affair. And my two, three of my aunts and my uncle. Uh, and just, uh, you probably met a lot of people and probably saw Miss Virginia's philosophy of it's what in your heart, not the counts, not the color of your skin. You probably saw that work, right? I mean, it, thank you very much. I just want to say on behalf of the family that uh, she was very grateful that everybody helped so much down here. And uh, she was a real appreciative of the whole community, how they donated things and money, and especially everybody here that worked hard, you know. And uh, she was, she, in her last couple conversations I had with her, she really expressed that sincerely. And uh, she realized everybody that, uh, you know, she didn't have the amount of help that uh, she couldn't reach as many people as she did. Oh, but uh, we all love her, and she really loved everybody, too. Oh, I know. I was just saying to Paul that uh, you tend to think of Miss Virginia as a one one person show, but it took a lot of people to, did. to make her, a lot of people pitching sure in. Like this young lady said, she's come every day for the last yeah. 10 years. I know. You know, and again, there's a lot of guys that come in and did some work on the home, and you yeah. know, and, I mean, this is amazing what they did. Especially the outside, you know. It is. It uh, was uh, looked like it was going to be condemned. I, I remember seeing this house. Yeah, I talked to a few of those. And so, uh, you know, every time, uh, seems like every time she needed money, got really down to that last couple of dollars. Some something came through. You know, God made sure there was some money here for her, and, and uh, it really was nice. Uh, and she really liked it. She was a remarkable woman in, in many ways, and one way was she, she didn't care much for red tape and bureaucracy. Not a bit. <laughs> I remember I, I did a documentary, and I remember coming here and just assuming this was nonprofit, you know. She said, oh, no, 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 the Lord provides. I, I don't, I, you know, if somebody's going to volunteer, they'll be here. I thought, gee, I wish I had that kind of faith. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It, yeah I think we all learned a lot from her. You know? Oh, I, I did. And, I mean, the, the things that are most obvious, her devotion to the poor and living as she preaches. But she also is outspoken, you know. When, well, when I got to know her, she thought, even the Pope, you know, if she thought the Pope was doing something wrong, she'd, she'd, tell, say. <laughs> she'd say, you know, that that was, yeah. so I admired her for that, too. Yeah, well, it took a strong person like that, I think, to, uh, oh. to organize and keep oh, things absolutely. going. Oh, absolutely. A lot yet of good would, leadership, and yet still be compassionate. And, and you'd come down here, and she'd be like the center of a storm. She'd be that calm. She's running around Miss Virginia, just give off this quiet kind of strength. And, yeah. And, uh inspired everybody. You're her nephew, nephew, is that correct? Yeah. Can I get your name? Uh, it's Phil Wiss. Thank you. And uh, my sister Nancy was here. And then her sister is my mother, which is, uh, she still lives in California. And she is unable to travel. But. Okay. You were talking about, it's kind of bare right now, Miss Virginia's, but you said in a few years back, and the elders brought in a load of food. Correct. Uh, one year when Elmhurst brought in a semi-load of food, the food was stacked from the front door to the back door, as high as the, almost as high as the ceiling all the way through the house. And there was only a little trail through the house. And uh, there were so much food that you could see them out of food from the street. So there were a lot of people curious wanting to, to uh, get their food. So. 
that was one of the first times I think that uh, Virginia had to actually structure the sharing to where she had to ask people to come back at a certain time the next day in order in order to have everything organized enough to accommodate the flow of this food. So many people, so much food. Yes. Had to change her plans a little bit. Was that about the time that she got shut down by the Board of Health? This was that was several years before. And uh, what in the world for? Well, for, when uh, she became better known as a place to get food, the uh, uh, food or the uh, health, Board of Health, uh, I believe, may have received a. a offbeat complaint from someone that was upset that they didn't, uh, they weren't able to get as much food as they needed. And it's unfortunate that here's a person who's in need, turns against the person who is trying to help them as much as they can. Talk about what's that old cliche, uh, biting the hand that feeds you. Something like that. Something like that. So, uh, at that time, the Board of Health began investigating and uh, That's right. came to the house and Did you know inspected the house and, and uh, gave a warning that, uh, that uh, uh, people are not allowed to share food from their homes where they sleep. So uh, we were very, tried to be as discreet as possible. And the, uh, one of the basic tenets of Miss Virginia's work was that she knew she would get to know people. She didn't uh, just dole out food. It was, it was a caring relationship that she developed with people. And uh, she considered that to be sufficient to satisfy her concern that that uh, she knows the person well enough to give them food that, that was okay and, and uh, we didn't have an alternative and uh, she continued to give out food from, the, from her home and in 1985 the Board of Health shut her down. For how long? Well, wow. until she uh, had an alternative. The immediate alternative that was used is that uh, I brought in a uh, pickup truck with a cap on it. And we just Bye, Howard. Bye, Sherry. Thanks for him. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Here, I'll get the door for you. Tell Paul to call the Southside Gardens. You too. 744-0468. Yeah, yeah, well, thanks for helping me on John Street when you did. Only God knows what that bipolar can do to a person. On November the 30th, that's St. Andrew's Feast Day, Andy got married to his wife in the church, and then that's the day in 97 that I took a healing and the depression left after 11 and a half years. So he's 12 years ago today, my dad told me he was going to die, and he was gone for the morning second. I don't know how Miss Virginia planned it. It's good to see you. Tell the boys I... Well... They're kind of... Where are you living at now? Bar Street? 3421. Jones is still the landlord. 456-3939. On the corner of Oxford and Hannah, 3515, across from the gas way, this is the house, and I'm over on Tom Nose on Bar Street where the Virgin Mary's in the yard. Okay. She ain't gone nowhere. There was a guy who stole the Virgin Mary a few years ago, and he said, I want $20 for it. And uh, Trent gave him $20, and he, and he brought her home. And that man's house burned down, and they took him away to an institution. You got a trip? I would have got your flower now. Mom said, be careful with the statue. So I told Rosie, if Trent and Andy don't take it, make sure she takes it someplace. Okay, tell her I'll call her my partner. I don't know why. Okay, Thanks, brother. But Miss Virginia said she thinks it protects me. You said that, y'all. Okay, you were saying that. Uh, the, the, the food that they were banning wasn't like 
mashed potatoes. It was like canned food. Can, yeah, mostly, good canned food. It was uh, mostly canned goods that uh, that was either collected at churches or other food drives or purchased at discounted uh, various stores and uh, loaves of bread that were uh, sealed and contained. Mm -hmm. uh, everything was contained. And, uh, and their compromise, that, that, that's, you said that's when the garage back there got built to put the food in. Right, so then the uh, compromise was that if the garage was put up in back, then food could be served out to the back, but it made it very difficult because people would come in the front door to ask for help, and part of the mission is to develop a relationship with people to know, uh, you know, what, how they're doing, and if you have to go to the back of the house uh, in the backyard to get food, it uh, it became uh, very uh, difficult to to keep the flow keep the flow going. <laughs> it's difficult to keep the conversation going. Yeah. <laughs> Who's this? Who might this be? This is Benjamin. 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 I knew who it was. He's one of, he's a producer at, uh, at the loft. Yes, he is. He did a show at the loft. So we recognize our producers, Benjamin. So besides erasing kind of spontaneity between the people, also it was a hardship. Miss Virginia, at that time, was in her 80s. It's not easy for an older lady to walk behind the house. Now she'd have to go down three steps, and then uh, for security reasons, there is a heavy board uh, across the back, uh, and you have to look that heavy board out, which is kind of jammed in to be secure. Right, right. It's a real big job just to go out to get a loaf of bread. Oh my gosh, yeah. And I think it uh, uh, raises the question regarding uh, the need to change the law that uh, keeps people from sharing. Absolutely. Kind of, it works against itself. Yes. Yes. I mean, when it's taking food out of the mouth of the hungry, it's definitely not a good problem. Yeah. It's, it's increasing the transaction. Uh, they're going to put it into some kind of incorporated thing called the Mission Incorporated. Yeah, it's going to be run like uh, St. Mary's, I think. That's what I heard. Probably Tom or whatever. Check your hostess snacks before you take them. 91. She opened her mission house on Hannah Street back in 1951, and since then has turned away no one in need, offering them food, clothing, and sometimes even shelter. You can help to keep her ministry alive by donating to Miss Virginia's mission house at Post Office Box 12045. That's Fort Wayne 468. Most of the people there have not had religion formally for a long, long time. Open their hearts and chant and, and try to learn. Uh, more about religion, I think it will give that population a lot of hope. Bauer captured the trip on home video, and because the trip stirred so many memories, she says she might consider moving back to Cuba if Cuban leader Fidel Castro and his communist government are toppled in her lifetime. That must have been. Here, she put this morning on the Today Show. And that is where my line correspondent Chris broke the familiar battle cry on the NBC News Today Show vast right-wing conspiracy that has been conspiring against my husband since the day he announced for president. Indeed, Mrs. Clinton Court. There are things that are written and said about him. My attitude is, you know, we've been there before, we have seen this before. Bill Clinton has expressed no interest in finding out what really happened to his lifelong friend. The Clintons have been subjected to some vicious and false attacks. After all, they've been fought. But the Clintons and their defenders have repeatedly waved the right-wing flag as a defensive tactic. Yes, I was Bill Clinton's lover for 12 years. On Jennifer Flowers' allegations of a long-running affair. Yeah, you know, that's the bottom of the president's supporters like to attack the conservative Rutherford Institute, now financing her lawsuit. It's all about money. Plans up for an a dose of going up and a healthy dose of right-wing policy. On Tennant Star, the independent counsel and his Whitewater investigation Mrs. Clinton today leveled this broadside. 
We get a politically motivated prosecutor who is allied with the right wing. Virginia. I am a blessed man. Three times I've been in the presence of a saint. One I traveled a great distance to see and risked my life in doing so. Also in the 80s at the time of our meeting, Septimus Pat was to the blacks of the South who were shut out of America's minds and political sin. Her work to get blacks to vote led her to be a mentor to other aspiring black leaders. One such young man was worldwide prominence, and when he made his journey to Norway to accept his Nobel Peace Prize, he asked Septima Clark to accompany him. His name was Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. My third saint, well, she too was in her 80s when we met, and she never rose to fame on little old Fort Wayne, but her devotion to the poor was legendary, and her vow of poverty in her own life were every bit the equal of Maria and Septima, and even of her own grown mother, Teresa. I first met Miss Virginia several years ago when, with my friend Jamie Smead, I was making a documentary, Voices of Hunter, for the Community Harvest Food Bank. She was so gracious and humble, and yet outspoken in her simple way, that I knew I was in the present greatness. She paid us the great honor of attending our premiere held at IPFW. I remember her still, sitting in that room, commenting, The Pope could feed the hungry just with the money he spends on furnishings in the Vatican. That statement was classic, Miss Virginia. It didn't matter who you were, if you weren't doing your part to erase and you were going to hear about it, Virginia. Whenever friends came into town, especially from another country, I always took them down to meet her. I wanted to show them there was somebody in this town I was proud of. The time I remember most about Miss Virginia had nothing to do with interviews or TV cameras or meeting new friends. A few years ago, she was in the hospital. I had told my dad and brothers about this remarkable woman, and they all went with me to visit her. Even in her helpless condition, she managed to smile and squeezed our hand. I never felt so close to my family as I did at that moment. Spontaneously, with no discussion of any kind, each of us reached in our pockets and gave her a donation for work. It was the money, of course. It was the gesture, the feeling behind it, that motivated the contribution that made that moment so special. We all heard something that day that went beyond words or even thought. Call it spirit. What does saint do for you? Elevate you to a place you've never been, a higher ground. And if we aren't able to stay there, being the mere mortals we are, just being there makes us realize such a spot exists, and we know we can aim higher. I wish I had told Miss Virginia this. I wish I had told Maria in September. Sep I wish I had told Miss Virginia this. I wish I had told Maria and Septim what knowing them meant to me. I'm telling them now. This was a gathering at Miss Virginia's Mission House after her funeral at St. Paul's Catholic Church today. 